Well, I'm uh, pretty honored to be able to uh, to be part of the AGM this year for the American Fisheries Society uh, Ontario chapter. Um, Phil Bird reached out to me after uh, seeing a lunch and learn on the barefoot box culvert and said, you need to present at AFS. So uh, we made things happen and, and I'm very fortunate to be here. So my name's Christopher Full. I'm a senior aquatic ecologist with RJ Burnside and Associates. Uh, I've been in the consulting world for probably over 20 years, uh, be 23 now, uh, graduate of Sir Sanford Fleming College in Lindsay, Ontario. I've had the opportunity to work across Canada and internationally on fisheries related projects. And um, RJ Burnside and Associates is uh, a company that employs 350 plus people. Uh, we do engineering, environmental consulting, various aspects of engineering, structural, water resources, um, sewage treatment, the list goes on, a lot of environmental assessment work, <clears throat> linear type projects, uh, road transportation, and we also have uh, Negan Burnside, that's 51% Aboriginally owned, so we are also working on um, Indigenous uh, projects. So anyway, uh, the, the, the presentation today is about an innovative box culvert design that supports rook trout spawning and thermal conditions. Uh, the barefoot box culvert is a uh, a unique and innovative. Let me just oh, a second. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Sorry, just need to know how to move it around. So, anyways, the presentation overview. Uh, we're going to go into some background about the barefoot box culvert. Uh, we're going to look at a couple case studies, design and performance, and its application in real world conditions. And if you stick around, we'll have a video at the end that I think is worth watching. Um, so our first location that uh, the barefoot box culvert was to be installed was in Melanchthon. It was a, um, a project that required um, permitting through Conservation Authority, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, we're looking at a degraded cast in place structure, uh, very expensive to replace as a three sided structure. And we got thinking about uh, another option that may help and support uh, thermal conditions and uh, groundwater input into the system. So with regards to the background uh, on the barefoot box culvert, we are always kind of dealing with uh, permitting and regulatory aspects of how we, um, we have a, a project completed and permitted. And we go through different aspects of design and how we can support uh, the conditions within the water course. And one of the things that always seems to come up uh, with regards to three-sided structures is morphology and also groundwater input. Um, we have to look at uh, the hydraulic models and conformance to flow to make sure the openings um, size large enough to convey those flows and it has to be designed appropriately. Uh, the big thing is to replicate form and function with regards to channel uh, meandering and substrate types, making sure that there's embedment and suitable um, suitable uh, substrate and groundwater input. Sorry about that. So with regards to form and function, we want to replicate channel plan form with regards to morphology, riffle pool structures, um, uh, channel conditions with regards to depth and uh, substrate, uh, maintaining thermal regime, which is very important with regards to cold water systems. Uh, brook trout are very sensitive. They are a cold water species and they require groundwater input to, uh, to survive. It's a life history requirement and process uh, requirement for groundwater input. Uh, if there is no groundwater input, brook trout have very hard time spawning. Uh, the groundwater input into these systems um, allow for incubation of eggs and thermal conditions that support through winter. Um, that is usually pretty dependent on the years, but can, can be pretty uh, detrimental with regards to frazzle ice and that sort of thing with regards to fall spawning species. Uh, suitable substrate, obviously using good granular material, a diversity of sizes is very important because uh, size range of of substrate, how the matrix uh, works. It's basically a variety of sizes, but having the right stone size so that it doesn't get washed uh, through the system and uh, ensuring that uh, it's clean substrate without uh, silts and clays that would maybe block 
um, groundwater input. So in order to understand <clears throat> how barefoot works and um, the requirements for groundwater and what happens within these systems, we have to understand uh, the groundwater to surface water relationship. And with this uh, slide, you can see how shallow and deeper groundwater systems contribute to the surface water. And uh, we've got a tile drain obviously collecting surface into uh, from agricultural fields and you see that dump in. But uh, the shallow groundwater flow is the one that's really important because of the lateral movement of groundwater. <clears throat> Those shallow groundwater systems are typically the ones that are supporting the headwater type streams. Um, these, these smaller headwater type streams that support brook trout <clears throat> definitely uh, require groundwater to, to function. And um, they're where you find groundwater in these systems and brook trout present, uh, you have potential to find spawning, um, spawning areas. So the deeper groundwater system, we believe, you know, coming through bedrock and those deeper aquifers, uh, not contributing that, that type of water, the, the really deep water seems to be a little bit different with regards to water quality uh, and conditions. So uh, we're typically focusing on the lateral and shallow groundwater system. Uh, another term to, to be aware of is the hyperreic zone and how that groundwater and surface water uh, interreacts uh, and, and the interrelationships between um, how surface waters react with, uh, with groundwater and the water table in the hyperreic zone. Having that lateral shallow groundwater input is very important. So what were our thoughts? Uh, we, we've we basically came up with an innovative box culvert design that allowed for groundwater input through perforations in the base of uh, the precast structure. Um, these perforations uh, were strategically placed uh, in each section of the, of the culvert. Uh, sections are usually 2.4 meters long and then depending on the span width of the road, uh, your culvert will be that width depending on road design standards. Uh, with regards to um, the structural integrity of, of the culvert itself. Uh, we had to maintain that structural integrity for transportation design standards and uh, road use. Obviously important, the natural channel design aspects of how water flows through a structure is very important and uh, ensuring that there isn't erosion, that there's low flow channel and allowance for uh, base flows to have depth to allow for fish to use, um, use the area. And with regards to aquatic conditions, we, you know, we know culverts uh, support fish habitat and support fish. They, they use them as uh, refuge lo locations, um, plunge pools and, um, you know, areas even cover from the culvert itself. Uh, if you're a brook trout fisherman and, and um, you, you target those species, uh, uh, you will find brook trout around culverts in, in systems that support brook trout. So, we need to compare the two structures. Um, we need to provide that input and uh, relationship between designs to, to understand how this is going to work. And if you just watch my cursor here, I'm gonna go through a few things. So really what we're comparing here, the barefoot box culvert on the left and the clear span on the right. Um, with the clear span bridge, you require footings on competent soils, compact tills, sands, bedrock. Uh, these footings are typically cast in place. They're solid. They support the structure, which is a th could be a three-sided structure or cast in place structure. But what we typically find with the shallow groundwater system is that that groundwater uh, deflects off the walls uh, and the footings within um, the zones next to uh, the structure itself. And that's why we put big O pipe or tile next to these uh, footings to, to get the groundwater to move away or any kind of water that's uh, next to the footings. Based on the barefoot box culvert in our design, um, typical precast structures are placed on clear stone bedding. So it's basically pea stone type gravel, uh, a lot of interstitial space, uh, a lot of voids for water to come in. And um, with those perforations in the bottom of the precast structure, allowing for lateral movement of groundwater to come up and into the, the culvert itself and within the substrate that's placed there. You can't see it uh, with this section uh, view, but there's a cutoff wall. So that is basically the footing, as we would call it, on a precast structure. It is basically that wall at the bottom end that keeps the structure from moving. And that's the barrier that allows the groundwater to come into the system. So an overview, just looking at the clear span and how we relate groundwater movement uh, within 
the comparison between the two systems and uh, lateral movement of groundwater can be deflected, whereas the groundwater and shallow groundwater inputs uh, can be conveyed through those perforations and the cutoff wall that I was just explaining to everybody, this is the downstream or down gradient barrier that allows that pressure and movement of water up through those, the perforations. So, you know, something we have to consider is, is the comparisons, you know, people are going to be asking, well, why do we use a barefoot? Why can't we just use a standard box culvert? Why shouldn't we use a bridge? Um, with regards to this practical application in this session that, um, you know, we're all involved in here, it, it really relates to practical application of, of an idea or a method or a way to make something work. Uh, allow for it to work and uh, possibly solve those problems. And in consulting, that's something we regularly have to do. That is our job is to solve problems and do it in a way that doesn't create a whole lot of cost, overhead costs, because our clients are looking for us to solve that problem without spending a lot of money. We would love to research <laughs> uh, the heck out of everything we do, but we, we don't get that opportunity. Uh, although there may be one in the future if, uh, if people stick around for the mentoring session. So anyway, uh, with regards to these different the comparison between the two culverts or the, th the two culverts and the clear span, uh, we look at time equals money and time in the water. I'm not gonna go through you know, detail on this one, but basically what it relates to is standard box culvert and barefoot are very similar, although the barefoot allows for uh, thermal conditions to be improved and groundwater input to, to occur. When you look at clear span with footings for same stru uh, structure size, you're, you're talking about uh, an increase in cost. So from length then, uh, this barefoot box culvert was $300,000 um, constructed. And for a three-sided cast and place structure, it would have been $450,000. So you think about the coffers that municipalities have that actually pay us consultants to do work. Um, those those coffers get spent fairly quickly if, if they're being spent on infrastructure and the opportunity to improve other structures. Um, you know, obviously, if you've got 150,000 to spare because you saved it, then you can look at uh, improving those structures. So um, I think it was very attractive to uh, some of our clients. So when we look at um, how these structures are placed, I think it's it's beneficial to see what actually happens in the field, what, what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, they are craned in place, these large structures. They, um, um, this is pretty big construction uh, with regards to a comparison to a CSP or even, um, you know, bridges, for example. Um, this, this culvert was placed within two days. Uh, we had the full five sections placed. Uh, you'll see, I think if you see my cursor here, this is the male end and the female end fit in. There's a gasket in between. Doesn't allow water to escape through there because we don't want any issues with freeze thaw and ground conditions uh, underneath the uh, asphalt. Um, but to note, I think what's more important, a lot of science minded people here that we, uh, how we tested the barefoot box culvert. These are uh, piezometers that were placed in the perforations and uh, the substrate that we used uh, for, for this site. So the as conditions, uh, a couple of weeks after the, the culvert was placed, um, we can note that there's a limited footprint, um, very attractive to the regulating authorities that we're not making a big mess. Uh, we're in and out of the water fairly quickly. Uh, DFO likes that. And um, we're not taking up a lot of time and closing roads for long periods of time, which is associated with bridge structures. We've, when you have to form footings, pour concrete, make sure the concrete's to structure uh, requirements for um, MPA and placing structures on top of the concrete footings is, it takes time for everything to, uh, to be good to go. So um, I think what's important is, is looking at how, and how we tested the barefoot box culvert, uh, keeping in mind that, you know, we are consultants and we have kind of limited research type money. I, I would say there isn't any, but we did use some uh, internally. I think some came out of our own pocket and, um, we decided to take a look at how this functions. Um, this barefoot box culvert in Melanchthon went into the Pine River. If you're resident in Southern Ontario, uh, the Pine River discharges or basically flows through Melanchthon and ends up in the Nottawasaga. It is a, a very high quality cold water 
uh, stream that supports uh, brook trout, model sculpin, and um, a great location to, to determine if brook trout are going to use uh, a structure like this. And also a bit tough in a way that, you know, when you're looking at thermal conditions with a groundwater system uh, or groundwater systems contributing to uh, these colder upper reaches, it's tough to pick out those nuances that relate to temperature and, you know, really determine what's happening. So we put pisometers uh, in, in the barefoot box culvert and we looked at, um, you know, what the surface water conditions were like with regards to hydraulic gradient and groundwater input and groundwater upwelling. We looked at temperature and uh, obviously every time we went to the site, we would make observation, uh, you know, observation of trout use or trout being there. And um, we've done quite a few surveys uh, with regards to underwater video. Uh, one other aspect that uh, we did take into consideration is that if if something's perforated and we've plugged a, we needed to plug a few areas just to make sure that we were seeing the performance of the barefoot box culvert so um, like i said we put uh, bosometers inside each of the perforations you saw four there and i'm gonna uh, go through those conditions just to add also dfo's monitoring uh, those conditions with regards to the regulatory agency and um, we did see some positive results so uh, here's uh, a couple of photos just regarding the piezometers. This is 10 slot uh, stainless steel well point. Uh, we use diver, solness diver, um, automatic water level loggers, and um, we place those inside the piezometers. And we, with this uh, schematic, you can see where we've placed uh, these piezometers. We did upstream, downstream, uh, shallow and deep, but primarily concentrating on the base of the culvert and the underside of the culvert. What we did see uh, right off the hop was uh, good positive uh, groundwater upwelling within those piezometers. And you can see where these blue triangles are, that's signifying the groundwater levels within the piezometers. And um, uh, right off the hop, we had anywhere from three to five centimeters of, of upwelling. And uh, this deeper one actually was pretty exciting, almost contributing um, artesian type conditions. So, we installed this, the first barefoot went in in November, uh, or sorry, October 2015. Uh, these are the groundwater levels uh, within the piezometers. The blue line on the bottom is the uh, creek level. Anything above that signifies uh, groundwater uh, upwelling and um, potential. We talked with our hydrogeologists about what this means, and um, they basically said, hey, if you have even uh, 0.5 uh, centimeters above creek conditions you you have potential there so in some situations we saw upwards to three and four centimeters uh, above the creek level in uh, two years later we uh, we were collecting data and and using a solness uh, automatic water level logger having staff obviously able to look at groundwater conditions we do a lot of groundwater modeling uh, for our clients and um uh, having that data available and, and collecting it it's you know you've sent you've basically deployed a logger and it's going to collect information for a period of time. The big thing is that you hope it doesn't fail and you get your information, your results, and you're able to, um, to determine what's going on. Um, we did go back a couple of years later just to do some manual measurements. And I think this is really what this is showing uh, with the blue line on the bottom, the creek level. And um, these are upstream shallow, upstream deep, downstream shallow and uh, creek levels. We're, we're seeing consistently these um, upward gradient or groundwater potential above the creek level. So positive results with regards to the groundwater uh, input. One thing I noticed in the culvert itself when it got placed is that, um, you know, there was a few things. Uh, there was observations that I thought were related to fish use, uh, just kind of clearing off areas. Um, you know, they, they Brook trout can be pretty elusive. If you've ever studied brook trout and, and had a chance to work with them, they're, they're pretty skittish. Um, they take off fairly quickly and um, they're not easily found. But when they want to spawn, they, they do gravitate to areas that are suitable. And those, gra those, those areas have to have groundwater upwelling. Um, so we started to see some, some indication and, you know, just kind of like brushing off of rocks, like where, where fish would appear to be using and clearing off um, seem to be suspect but you know it's early so let's let's just see what happens 
um, an overhead view of uh, both piezometers and um, the automatic wire level locations. And we used Hobo um, stream temperature loggers, place them up and downstream and within uh, the buyer foot box culvert itself. We wanted to take uh, collect some data with regards to surface water conditions. The automatic wire level loggers do do that, but also uh, having surface water um, temperature conditions were ideal just to see if we would see any difference in, in temperature. Now, that being said, this is a very cold water. Uh, this is, it rarely goes above 18 degrees and uh, typically around 15, 16 and, and ideal uh, temperatures for brook trout. Uh, one thing that, that did come up, though, and people had asked is, uh, you know, were, were brook trout using the area prior to uh, the placement of the culvert? And we did note that there was a spawning site just downstream of the culvert. And that spawning site uh, in consecutive years remained to be ac active. And that was important to us because we didn't want to take away from what was available. Uh, some may ask, well, if groundwater, if you're, if you're, you know, if groundwater is coming through your system or your barefoot box culvert, are you taking away for the opportunity for other areas to be successful? And um, uh, we noted that brook trout were spawning in those areas still with barefoot in place. I uh, just shot of the hobos, um, you know, using stakes in the stream bed, simple uh, camping stakes and flagging tape and stuff that's easy. You know, we need to think about ways to solve problems and and keep it simple. Um, so let's take a look at the surface temperature data. Uh, I think this is kind of important with regards to the function and the results of what we were getting from barefoot. Uh, that pink line at the top, that's that's the surface uh, or air temperature kind of going through the roof on a warm day in June. And uh, this blue line in the, the middle here, this is the creek temperature. Um, these are surface water, uh, the hobo results here and you get this peak uh, on the upstream end and these are diurnal peaks with regards to uh, you know the heat of the day and down here we're seeing our um, temperatures from our automatic water level loggers uh, definitely below the creek temperature which is, is good to see and the potential for uh, input to uh, to the system through the barefoot. Another kind of overview of a multiple of days uh, in September we do see typically low water conditions um, and uh, not a lot of precipitation, but we still see that heated day uh, that's happening. We've got still kind of summer-like conditions. We've seen that in the last couple of years where it seems that summer creeps into October and even past that. So uh, just looking at how that was working, how the barefoot was working in, uh, in September, and we're still seeing those same sort of nuances with regards to the uh, the temperature data and the groundwater data still being low. Um, just a little note on the groundwater aspect in the winter, you know, you might see it as low as four degrees, but four to six degrees. And in the summer, it will, those shallow groundwater systems will, uh, will fluctuate a little bit because of ground temperature. And you could see groundwater temperatures uh, uh, input into your streams around the eight to, to 12 degree range, uh, depending on your sources and where they're coming from. So, We did talk about a, uh, I showed you on the, the schematic, the cross section there, a deeper um, piezometer that we placed in there just to kind of think about the potential for augmenting if needed, you know, and we, we talk about thermal conditions being impacted. We talk about climate change, um, you know, what we're kind of experiencing now with regards to the heat of summer. And uh, my thought was more around, hey, if we had to, you know, rehabilitate a cold water system that, that might have lost its brook trout population because of thermal issues, is there a potential that we could do it through barefoot uh, by augmenting and providing a source of cooler water uh, into the system? And, and we played around with that a little bit, uh, basically using some, some pretty... Um, standard type items other than the logger itself but a, a screen for a, a sink inverted and uh, you know metal wire clipped uh, to the logger and then placed in the substrate uh, we've we've removed the top section of the piezo and put the automatic wire level just in the surface um, granular substrate and i'm just backing it up here uh, putting the substrate on top just to make sure that uh, it's not going anywhere and people don't take it <laughs> Anyway, here's an overview, just a photo, um, our upstream uh, hobo and downstream 
hobo, this area right here is where uh, the piezometer um, is underneath the substrate. You've got a little bit of organic settling on top, but it seems to be that the organics are moving a bit. Um, you know, it's this basically visual observation. And with regards to the location of the upstream and downstream hobos, we're, we're hoping that we might see something. Well, we took a look at the data and, you know, it, it can be tough. I mean, this, this is, there's a lot to look at here and um, there's, there's many lines, but I just want to focus on the main lines that kind of stood out to me. So in a summer condition, we're hoping that, you know, upstream of a groundwater input, it might be warmer, um, the groundwater input coming into the system and directly downstream from the groundwater input, it would be cooler potentially uh, from the discharge of groundwater. So that purple line, dark purple line is the upstream and the blue line just below it. And, um, and this is the Creek in itself, the blue line below it um, is showing on average in some places a half to a degree during some very, very warm days in July. So, so this was interesting. I'm, I'm not going to hold my hat on it, but I do know that it happened consecutively. And when those lines come together and then they peak again, then, you know, it's, it's something that's there that maybe we could look deeper into. Uh, so those are the summer conditions showing uh, a cooler uh, surface water just downstream from that input uh, from one of the perforations. In the fall, conversely, what we would see is uh, a change. We've When we have those temperatures plummeting down and starting to get cool in surface water, uh, we, you know, we would expect that groundwater is going to hold its temperature. It's not going to cool down too fast yet. We haven't seen the peak of winter. And the groundwater should be in around that six degree, seven degree uh, range still and not being impacted by the air temperatures. So conversely, we would expect to see that the water temperature would be cooler upstream and then potentially warmer downstream. I was really excited about this aspect, but we did see and these pink lines where we start to see it plummet down and these cooler temperatures show up in November, uh, upwards to a degree uh, upstream and downstream. We're talking, you know, literally 30 centimeters from the upstream and downstream um, data collection points from the piezometer. So, you know, like I said, I mean, we, we don't have the funding to do academic studies um, um, and that we can talk about later, but it, it's kind of being innovative in how we hopefully get some answers on the results without breaking the bank, right? Uh, this was unique. We, we were really excited. Uh, like I said, we did see um, evidence of brook trout using the culvert, uh, the barefoot box culvert. And, and we thought, you know what, we'd been working um, and we met with Precision Biomonitoring Inc. at Laternal. Uh, pretty excited about their eDNA services. Uh, we do offer eDNA services through uh, PBI. And um, we thought about using a uh, high resolution study within the culvert to see if there was any eDNA uh, aspects that, that we could determine if there was any elevated eDNA within the culvert itself. So we were seeing evidence, not necessarily um, observed evidence of brook trout spawning, but evidence of fish being in it and using it. So we did a baseline study in uh, March 2019. We did uh, 10 uh, samples without throughout the section and collected baseline DNA. Um, and that kind of established where we were at. And then we came back and did a high resolution study in November 2019. Uh, worked with Dr. Stephen Crooks uh, with PBI. Um, they've been pretty busy with the whole COVID rapid testing thing. and um, um, but uh, it's pretty exciting for them. Uh, they, they do offer eDNA services and uh, we did have the opportunity to, to work with them on that. So they developed the study, uh, the high resolution study and um, we did take uh, a number of samples within the culvert itself. We did a grid system and I'll show you the overview in the next slide. But when I talk about use and um, like I said, brook trout can be very elusive and, and may not be there when um, when you're there or you know beginning and end of spawning eras uh, or times during the year that they they might not be on site. But we would see this and this this really really caught my interest and and it it resonated with me. I believe that they were using it and spawning in there. So I wanted to get the eDNA results, see if it if if it told us anything. So these are the eDNA results from Precision Biomonitoring Inc. And uh, as you can see from the overview, number seven up in the middle here, this is the uh, kind of high, 
suspected high occupancy location um, or elevated brook trout use. Uh, we did upstream, we did downstream, direction of flow and uh, replicate samples throughout the base of the culvert, uh, or sorry, within the, the water regime. Um, near substrate, uh, we, you know, we, were, we were looking at kind of getting information from what was there. We did this during low flow conditions. We wanted to avoid that flow aspect that could relate to DNA movement. Um, and um, yeah, we had a chance to sit down with the results and we did see that uh, uh, the left side of the culvert um, definitely had higher results for eDNA uh, compared to the right side of the culvert. And uh, within seven, some, some pretty high numbers um, within that higher occupancy area. But if we look at, you know, 13, 11, 4, 6, um, 11, 4, 6, 7, you know, we were seeing those higher numbers and the higher scale of eDNA um, within those samples. So uh, this is about two years later. Um, I think what's important about these slides is that uh, noting that the the natural conditions are um, coming back fairly fairly quickly. Uh, you've got Veronica watercress, you've got good riparian vegetation, substrate maintenance is there. Uh, you do have you still have sediment transport, you still have uh, conditions that are functioning uh, as a cold water stream and and that is important to us. I said I'd make it a little different too and, and add uh, a bit for those that um, that may have been at the lunch and learns that I had done in the last couple of weeks. Um, very fortunate to have a number of people from MNRF, MECP, DFO, MTO, Trout Unlimited, Ontario Streams, the list goes on, even some that are retired that decided to come and, and hang out for an hour and uh, very, very fortunate to be able to put on those lunch and learns uh, with regards to the results of Barefoot. Uh, but one of the things that came out with Sarah was, um, you know, with regards to impassable barriers, uh, gene transport, uh, opportunities for um, improving conditions, uh, mitigation with regards to fish movement. This is the Bateau Creek. Uh, this is another location that the Barefoot Box Culvert went in. These are the existing conditions uh, prior to the Barefoot Box Culvert going in in this location. We had a obviously an impassable barrier during low flow conditions uh, to the bottom left here. And uh, this would be a hot spot on opening day. Um, bit of a gong show, I think, there in the morning um, because a bunch of steelhead would not be able to get up that during low flow conditions. And um, yeah, if you've experienced opening day, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, it uh, it, it it trapped a few fish, and um, some would get up it. I mean, steelhead no, have no problem jumping that. But I think it's a matter of uh, connecting upstream and downstream during those other life process stages. Uh, uh, the juvenile stages and, and movement between upstream and downstream, allowing that gene movement to happen um, upstream. So we um, we mitigated this this barrier using a, another uh, another design of barefoot box culvert. But this design included baffles, and we've got V-notch v baffles within the culvert itself and the perforations in the bottom. The V-notch baffles allow for um, the retention of uh, granular substrate and large kind of keystones and uh, also allowing uh, groundwater input through the base through the perforations uh, we were able to mitigate this barrier it's about a four percent slope in here um, you know a bit of stone moving around and that's kind of the stuff I like to do I love being in there and and working with the contractor to make sure we've got something that's going to work and we basically call this a rocky ramp within a, uh, a culvert itself um, it will allow free movement of fish through there I'm not sure that the steelhead anglers will be happy on opening morning, but uh, maybe they'll find somewhere else to find some fish and not shoot them in a barrel. So um, this this was uh, an exciting project on Bateau. This is a cold water system. It does not have brook trout in it, uh, but thermal conditions need to be sustained for uh, for juvenile steelhead or rainbow trout. So what are some of the conclusions, takeaways uh, with regards to you know our our observations of the barefoot box culvert. So we did see groundwater upwelling. We saw groundwater potential in our pisometers and the automatic water level loggers. Uh, we had elevated levels of eDNA within the barefoot box culvert and, um, and um, 
it, it was pretty exciting uh, to work with Steve on that. Uh, the documentation of brook trout spawning, which I'm going to get into next, uh, I said I had a video and um, we did uh, we did get the opportunity to uh, put a few GoPros inside uh, the barefoot box culvert and, um, and we'll look at that video in a little bit here. Uh, we did see Young of the Year emergence. Yes, Chris, just yep. so you know, we're, we're about five minutes left on time. So okay, uh, if you want to yep. quickly wrap it up. <laughs> yep, no problem. I'm done. Uh, with regards to Melanchthon, they saved about 150000 uh, on their project. So this is, uh, this is a photo that's pretty dear to my heart. Um, I was able to uh, clip this from uh, a time lapse video. Uh, if anybody's wondering, this is a brook trout. Uh, it's in its, its glory. It's uh, created a uh, spawning nest inside the barefoot box culvert. Um, I think I've gone through the considerations why to are the thoughts of why to consider barefoot. Uh, it's, it has an opportunity. It does relate to um, something that's innovative that we've been able to prove that, that it works. So I will get into um, the video and if that works out. Yeah, and as Chris is just setting up the video, um, if you, Chris will be around for the mentorship session as well. So yeah. you know, throughout the afternoon, if you want to type questions into the chat or the Q&A, um, Chris can uh, answer them in there as well as um, like later on in the afternoon as well. So yeah, yeah, great opportunity, I think. Okay, so if I press play, hopefully this will work as proposed. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, we were able to get GoPros. I put a wide angle view uh, overhead and also uh, an underwater GoPro uh, two, two times of the year, including one spring event. The two times that the GoPro was in the water, we had all of about an hour and a half footage. Those GoPro batteries don't last long. Uh, they go fairly quickly, but we were pretty happy about the results. Can everybody hear the, the sound okay? Sarah? It doesn't. No, no sound or video. No sound or video. You, Do you might have it playing on a different screen. Um, same screen I'm looking at, but. You might just have to close your PowerPoint. The PowerPoint at the moment is, is blocking it. Oh, okay. Give me a second here. Second. So if I share my screen now, it should work. You guys see it now? Yep. Okay, let's start it from the start. Hopefully the sound works. You hear me? Yep. Okay. Can you hear the sound? Um, no sound. No, no sound. but if it's just the music, we can. It's okay. I'll yeah. sing. I'll just go through it. So, um, just looking at spring and fall conditions uh, within the culvert itself. Uh, substrate, types of substrate, good sorting. Uh, obviously, we want to maintain those conditions within the culvert itself. Uh, introductory of just some underwater footage. I've got brook trout in the system. Um, and some good sized fish, which were exciting to see. And we got a larger one that shows up. Kind of the star of the show here in a bit. So this part um, is very important. And when I talked about areas being used by fish, so this is the wide angle view within the culvert itself. You can see a large, there's a large male using this area, clearing off uh, the substrate, using this area, protecting it. 
And then we also captured, if you keep an eye on my cursor here, you'll see the flick on the side. So that's, that's a small uh, female clearing gravel off in this area. This, um, this spot, uh, we, we captured females using it and moving gravel around in this area. We're pretty excited about that because we, not only do we have a cleared off area that we see as being used, we have other areas within the culvert itself um, uh, being used. And we were able to capture this on, on uh, point of view camera. And when uh, Precision Biomonitoring came back and said, you know what, it's, it's interesting. We, um, we see some elevated results in those areas that you talked about and definitely along the left side uh, of the culvert and in those hot spots. And I said, you, you need to see the, the point of view camera video. So here again, you'll see um, in this area, you'll see a female using it. She just moved in through here. So, you know, kind of hard to see, but we picked it up. And, and that's one of the other aspects of using your equipment, understanding what its potential is. Uh, sometimes we don't have the end all be all best technology, but it's about using what you have to get the information you need. Uh, this is another uh, individual that's using this area and that uh, underwater um, photo of, of the area being used is right up here. This is showing male dominance uh, within the culvert itself. If you're aware of, you know, salmonids and char spawning, there, there can be some aggression and, and, and that male basically pushed that other one out. So, you know, these are exhibitions of, of spawning uh, behavior. So we're very excited about, about that. We also uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to put the GoPro under, uh, under the water. And this area I saw was cleared out. So obviously I put the GoPro where it was uh, cleared out to see if I would capture anything. Um, this is the December footage. Um, you know, I might think this is late in the air, but we do see brook trout spawning into, uh, into December, typically Southern Ontario into November. It can start a little earlier depending on your thermal conditions. Um, So what this area is, is on top of one of those uh, perforations. And um, we're seeing evidence of the brook trout uh, using this area, hanging out, protecting it, um, and very much attracted to this, this zone, which is, is pretty exciting. Um, kind of wish the sound was going because it's it kind of adds to the video and my singing's not great so I'm not going to go there but um, anyway one thing to note uh, with regards to your, your equipment and it'll come up in this next uh, clip another time lapse uh, your GoPros do have a flashing red light and if you're going to use them under the water and you're hoping not to spook fish use a piece of electrical tape cover that red dot uh, that's flashing and we do feel that uh, in this time lapse uh, there was uh, active spawning going on in, in this area, and uh, you could see the, the cloudiness of the water and, and some kind of, it looks like the fleeing of, of the, the individual um, as they're excavating or using the nest, and that might be because of the pulsing of the red light. So something to be uh, mindful of when you're, when you're using GoPros underwater to capture uh, any kind of imagery. And beware that, you know, the, the, the camera and, and the battery time is very limited uh, in cold conditions. And this, this, this water is going to be fairly cold in November and December. So at the end, I just wanted to cover it off with uh, what I feel is kind of most important. And that's uh, young of the year emergence and documentation within the barefoot box culvert. Uh, it, it signifies the full kind of gamut of what has happened. Uh, these young of the year don't stray far from where they've been hatched and to see them inside the barefoot was pretty exciting. So evidence of spawning, evidence of reproduction, evidence of use and temperature DNA. So pretty excited. Anyway, I thank you very much for your time and um, really interested with the knowledge that's uh, available today and everybody involved that there are questions. Uh, I, I will entertain any question. Um, don't be afraid to ask something that may even, you know, negate everything we talk about. I'm, I'm very interested in, in everybody's thoughts. So thank you.